So our first speaker is Dr. Andrew Stapleton, and so he's an expert communicator, strategist, and digital content producer. He's received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Newcastle in 2010, and since then he's been actively working as a communicator and blogger. So he works with professionals to create engaging digital, digital content and develop content strategies that drive online engagement. So I'll pass this over to you now, Andy, and ready for your talk. Excellent. Hello, everyone. How fun is this? All right. So, um, look, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach because if I had given this talk about six months ago, I would have uh, sort of, you know, tried to package down into 20 minutes something that would resemble kind of a strategy for communicating. And I looked at the other speakers here and I was like, you know what? These speakers are amazing and I'm sure that there's so much they have to offer that. Uh, in the last six months, I was like, this is what has really mattered to me. It's still about communication. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, as scientists, we're always looking outwards. We're always sort of talking about, well, how do we communicate our work? How do we, you know, produce videos? How do we get engagement? But that really isn't what is going to cause you the most success. So what I really wanted to do for myself today was to create a 20 minute talk that gave everyone that is watching at this conference the ability to succeed, right? Like, and that sounds like really wishy-washy, but the, in the last six months, I've been growing a YouTube channel around all science and communication. And the one thing that I found, the one issue is that academics and PhD students just are so uh, worried about their careers, about their science, about the future, that I thought I would distill down into 20 minutes the four top things that I think you can do, which will mean that you're not only successful in terms of your PhD or your research career, but importantly, that you actually enjoy the process along the way. And I've seen a massive amount of growth on YouTube by talking about these topics and I, I really sort of really wanted to share this with you today so um, get on in the chat if you've got any questions um, and I'm happy to sort of like pick and choose as we go I'm also happy to take questions at the end obviously but uh, let's start with let's have a look I'm going to share my screen um, I think it's this one yes let's share that all right does that work for everyone can people see that that's all good um, Perfect, perfect. So I want to talk about the unexplored communication in academia. And like I said, we're always so outwards facing, we're always so like driven by our H indexes and, you know, getting our grants that really the one thing, the one person in your career that can actually make a difference is you. Like, absolutely the only person in academia that can really make a difference in your career is you. So what I like, like, like I said, what I want to do is split down the most effective things that I've been talking about on my YouTube channel and give that to you guys as sort of like four simple ways that you can communicate with yourself to make sure that you're not lost in this weird, uh, crazy, competitive, uh, world of academia and uh, yeah, I hope that this is going to be super beneficial uh, Beneficial for you. So the first thing the first way you should communicate with yourself or the first thing you should tell yourself and remind yourself of constantly is you are not your career That is like the number one thing now think about why you are here right now Why have you decided to do a PhD? Why have you decided to uh, pursue one of the hardest intellectual things you can do, which is like independent research? And uh, I think for a lot of us, it's about, you know, we were the clever people. We were the clever people in our high school. And so we've kind of like forged this path. And the thing is that as we forge this path, we become so entwined with our own academic success that uh, I think a lot of PhD students that end up becoming academics, um, they just are their careers. And so getting past that and thinking to yourself, well, um, you know, my research career doesn't dictate and shouldn't dictate my happiness or my relationships or all of that sort of stuff. So you have to remind yourself constantly you're not your career. And I think 
as clever people. Everyone on this thing at the moment is super clever. There is no doubt about it. You wouldn't be able to do this research stuff, PhD stuff, without being awesomely clever. Um, and the thing is, is that we've developed, you know, these kind of uh, ways of accepting people be like, oh, you're the clever one. And we show that by getting good grades and good everything. And then we end up getting to a PhD. And in that PhD, we can no longer cram for an exam. We can no longer um, do the kind of all nighter to make sure that we get that A. So we get that external kind of gratification of people being like, wow, you're so clever. A PhD you cannot cram for, uh, academia you cannot do overnight, you can't leave it to that smooth. There's no systems really. It's all about doing little bits every day and working out your research career. So um, the one thing that I want you to remind yourself of always in terms of self-communication is I am not my career. You are so much more than that and uh, the, the identity that you form can become so intertwined with that that uh, yeah it isn't such a good thing to remind yourself so the next thing I'll share my screen again the next thing that you should remind yourself of is your goals so let me know in the chat like every time I speak to PhD students every time I speak to academics I always say like, what do you want to achieve? Like, where are you going? Do you want to be an academic? Let me know in the chat. Like, let me know if you've got an absolute sort of like crystal clear goal of where you want to end up. Because communicating to yourself this goal all the time is gonna be the thing that kind of dictates where you end up and how far you can go and how fast you can get there. Um, and when I was in a PhD world, an academia world, um, I had a massive interest in communication and science communication and talking and presenting and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I left to do a Cosmos internship in the middle of a postdoc, uh, like it was a two year postdoc. I finished after one year and uh, I just left. And everyone's like, oh, I wouldn't know what I would do if I was to leave academia. And the truth is, I didn't. I just knew that I didn't want to be an academic anymore, but I did enjoy the communication side of things. And, uh, you know, if you, you can't succeed in something if you don't know where you're heading. So a um, so, uh, question here from Joshua is, what are your aspirations, academia, industry? My thing at the moment is my own businesses. So um, over the last three years, I've been sort of uh, pursuing different avenues. So I, I've got my own startup, Verbalize Science, verbalize.science, where I help uh, scientists and institutions communicate their research with short audio and uh, video stories. But also over the last six months, my aspiration is to really just help these lost PhD and academic souls via the YouTube channel. And that's why I really wanted to talk about this today is because that seems to be where people are having the kind of most issues in terms of navigating a career in academia, because, you know, on the surface, it looks brilliant, but you delve a little bit deeper. And after a little bit of experiencing it, you, you notice how hard it is to, to kind of control your own career and get through. And so, yeah, having clear goals making sure you know where you're going. Do you want a career in industry? Do you want to stay in academia? Like it depends on you and you can't succeed if you don't have a goal. And when I left academia, I did not have a goal. And I spent the last three years kind of like fumbling around in the dark, trying to be like, well, where do I go? What do I do? Like, how do I do this? And uh, only recently have I kind of like found what I guess some people would call a purpose other people would call it passion, whatever you want to call it. But you need to be absolutely crystal clear on your goals and uh, set time frames and all that sort of stuff, because that will dictate essentially your, your growth, your trajectory, and uh, yeah, how satisfied you feel along the journey. So uh, I speak to loads of PhD students and academics, and I say, what do you want to do? And they go, I have no idea. Like the path of least resistance is strong in um in the kind of uh, phd world because they go well i don't really want to get a job i don't know what i'll do so i'll do a phd or i don't know what i want to do afterwards so i'll do a postdoc and all i think i see is loads of really undirected postdocs 
kind of stuck on the postdoc treadmill or trying their best to get grants and whatever. And uh, yeah, just really unsatisfied. So uh, yeah, uh, another question is, how can we expect people to know they want to work in industry when they might not have the experience? Simple answer is to go and get some experience. Like um, I left academia uh, after my PhD to go into industry. I worked uh, with Dino Nobel for a little bit and I decided it wasn't for me. I worked for 13 months for them. Um, you can also uh, speak to, actually, no, try this. There is an app called smarttribe.io. And what they do is they link clever people like you guys up with academics and people in the industry. And you can just ask these people these questions. They become like a little bit of a mentor. So head over to Smart Tribe, type it into Google, sign up, and they connect you once a month to someone in industry or academic uh, academia. And uh, it's an incredible service. I don't think it's been around for very long, but uh, that's how you can start building those connections, talking to people, and uh, yeah, definitely setting those goals and trying to work out what you do want. What's your actual purpose? What's your What's your mission? You know, all of that is so important and it can give you direction. And as you're growing and moving towards that, there's a much greater sense of fulfillment than feeling around in the dark and wishing for that next grant or that next paper to be accepted. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen again because the next thing I'd love to talk about, which I think is one of the most important aspects of everything that you do is one thing that you should talk to yourself and ask yourself regularly is what is actually in your control? And this seems to be one of the best questions and ways you can communicate to yourself to make sure that the academic kind of web doesn't get you trapped and the, the academic spider doesn't come and suck all of your, uh, all of your power and all of your insides out. Uh, and ultimately asking yourself in every single situation is what is in your control and then just ignoring the things that you cannot control. Because if you try to control the things that you cannot control, you are gonna go absolutely insane in academia and in research and in even it, like later on in whatever career you decide to do. So for example, what makes your career awesome? It is increased H index, bringing in that delicious money for the universities, getting your name on grants, etc. The thing is, with each of those three things, you cannot control them. Like getting your H index higher, you can't directly influence your H index. You can't decide if someone's going to cite your paper. You can't decide if a journal is going to accept your paper in a high impact factor. The second one, what did I talk about? I said grants. Like you can't decide. You can apply for grants. That is in your control, but you cannot, you know, get grants. It's, it's like you can do everything other than decide you're going to get a grant. And so working slowly on the things that you can control and asking yourself and communicating to yourself all the time is what is in, the, in my control and focusing solely on those. So you want to hire H index, you want to produce more papers. Well, the things you can control are getting in the lab regularly, setting aside times every single day where you do a little bit you do an hour on this certain experiment or two hours in the lab or you start writing up you know like structuring your day so that you're actually efficient and effective on the things that you can actually control i spent so long looking at my h index on scholar and being like oh it's never getting any higher. I'm publishing, I'm doing this, and it just caused so much stress and anxiety, and it was unnecessary. Do you know what? Since leaving academia, the last two years have been my best years in academia. I've got more citations, my H index has gone up. I haven't got any grants because I haven't applied for any, but if you just look at my H index, after three years of leaving academia, apparently I'm a better academic than when I was in there trying my hardest. And that's because I was focusing on the wrong things. I was focused on like growing my H index as opposed to focusing on the things I can actually control. And uh, this is, you know, all the way from stoicism back in the day where people were just saying, you cannot stress out, you cannot give mental energy to these things that you cannot control. So with all of the different things you want to achieve and all of your goals, you have to work completely within your sphere of influence because otherwise you're gonna have a terrible journey. You're gonna have a terrible time during the process. And uh, yes, 
focusing on what you can control and only worrying about the outcomes that you can control is important. You want more grants? The only way you can control that is by writing grant applications. So once your, um, once your kind of goal is set that I want more grants, your goal should actually be, I need to apply for X number of grants a year. That is going to be far more influential on you and give you more motivation than the next rejection from a 10% success rate grant scheme or whatever it is. Um, and I think that's super important. So uh, yes, ask yourself regularly, what is in your control? And only focus on doing that and not worrying about other things. That's the next one. And the last one is something that I've been doing over the past few years. And it is, let's see if I can get that across. You need to communicate with yourself every single day along the lines of what 1% improvement can you make today? Like the one thing we think, and when you're doing a PhD or when you're doing research is there's always this massive goal at the end of the there we are, we're good. At the end of the uh, day, there's always a massive goal. Get that paper, get that grant, get that thing. But that's not how, how the, you build up momentum. So every single day, all you need to ask yourself is, what 1% improvement can I make today towards my goal, towards getting that grant, towards getting that next job, to whatever, and keep that within your control? And 1% every day for a whole year adds up and it compounds and it gets better. So for example, the things that I'm interested in at the moment are growing um, verbalize.science, are growing the YouTube channel. Um, and I do that by, by essentially producing content regularly, producing the thing that I can control. I can't control if people subscribe. I can't control if I get new customers with verbalize.science. But what I can do is make a one tiny percent step towards that goal every single day and i can assure you that if you make that one tiny little step every single day you will get to your goal and it's so crazy and it sounds so sort of basic but consistency and accepting that a job done consistently but imperfect is better than waiting for yourself to do it perfectly like in the business world with herbalize.science making small steps every day towards communicating better to talking to customers to getting new customers like all of that is imperfect i make hundreds of imperfect actions rather than going well i'm not very good at, at marketing yet or oh, i'm not very good at communicating the value yet it's like no go out and do it do it the best you can and you will improve so what one percent improvement can you make every single day is one of the most important questions you can ask yourself and you can get easily bogged down with wanting to make the action perfect and don't do that just go and do what you can do and it will be good enough as long as you do repeat that imperfect action in a different imperfect way over uh, a year over two years and that's really how i've seen a, a kind of massive growth in uh, the channel, a massive growth with Verbalize, and uh, I know that it can work with academia too, as long as you focus what is actually in your control and ignore all the other things. Also, social media, while I'm on it, what a nightmare. I left uh, social media about four, a year ago, and the constant comparison in, in academia and in social media is just it's just crazy because you always think, well, surely I should be the one with the decro right now, or surely I should be the one with the funding right now, or oh, I'm a little bit behind this person because at this point in their career, they had this, um, they had this uh, grant or opportunity and I don't. And uh, the thing is, everyone runs their own race, but by focusing on what you can control, doing that small improvement every single day, I can guarantee you that you'll be much better off in a year's time than if you just wait and try to control those things you can't control. Um, so in the last song, I'm going to share my screen again. I'm an expert at this now. Um, so what 1% improvement can you make today? And committing to that is so important for success, for making your career valuable and not stressful, and for seeing genuine progress towards goals. All right plug for the channel go check out dr andrew stapleton or andy stapleton um like i said over the last six months 
it's there's been this massive growth in PhD sort of topics and interests and um, it's got me really excited because I know that there's a lot of people out there that I can help um, just because academia is a weird ass place it's full of egos it's full of all of these different areas which are hard to navigate communication with supervisors with with uh, yourself with uh, collaborators all of that is just so so crazy and uh, I hope that the channel will be a place of useful resources to help people navigate a career in a PhD in academia and uh, the rest of it so look that wasn't the talk I thought I was going to give when I first was invited but I think it is probably the most beneficial influential and actionable advice I could have given you in 20 minutes and I hope you agree to um, and now uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have um, in the chat elsewhere I don't know where you put them but yes I'm very happy to answer questions and uh, thanks for having me brilliant thanks Andy that was an awesome presentation um, yes yeah, so if you've got any questions feel free to send them through either in the chat or in the Q&A function um, I might start off with one. Um, so one of your big key points was the whole idea of goal setting. So yeah. do you focus more on using short-term goals or long-term goals or how to keep track of both? Yeah, I, so um, so a big goal, like a long-term goal, should be split split down into actionable steps. Like there's no doubt that, so my, actually I was speaking to my um, partner last night and I was like, what's your 10 year goal? And she immediately talked about what she was doing next week, next month. I was like, no, 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 the, like people can't think about 10 years ahead, especially I think in academia, because you're like, I don't know where I'll be. I have my, my grants for only three years or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, so I set 10 year goals and I make sure that um, to get there, I understand the small steps I need to take. For example, with Verbalize.Science, my startup, Obviously, I want it to be a million dollar company. Like, you know, I want it to be a big thing. But I don't focus on that, that goal necessarily. That's just aspirational. But every day I do a little bit towards, um, uh, towards that goal. So how do I make a million dollars? Well, I communicate the value of my company more often. Or I reach out to a customer once a week. Or I build current customers. So long-term goals, 10 years, you should absolutely set one. And it's so challenging. And people don't do it. But without a goal, how do you know if you've succeeded? There's too many of us just wandering around in the, in the dark. Like, it's just crazy. So yes, long-term goals. And then split that up into short-term controllable actions that will get you there. Great. Right. Uh, there's a question, can postdocs as well as P students learn, uh, PhDs, not P students, PhD students, uh, learn from the videos on your channel? I hope so. So, um, uh, John, I found that uh, a lot of people are asking about PhDs because they want to know what a PhD is like. And there's not, a, there's not an honest representation of what a PhD really is online. Um, you know, it's, it's too sciencey. It's too, like, aspirational. When, and really, think about your day. You know, it's not nitrogen, uh, liquid nitrogen explosions. It's not uh, rockets across a, across a classroom, which is how people normally think about science. Um, so yes, uh, to answer your question, I'm bumbling, is yes, I hope postdocs can learn because I talk about the steps that I think people can take and the mindsets that they can adopt to actually get to, you know, in their case of PhD, but in your case, it could be um, a postdoc or the next grant or something like that. So I really hope that it can, it can be useful. Every time I say PhD, just slot in in your mind uh, academia and I think you'll be fine. Um, what's the name of my YouTube channel? So it's my name, Andy Stapleton, A-N-D-Y-S-T-A-P-L-E-T-O-N. Um, and then Pi, what are the motivations for staying in academia or going into industry or other career paths? So um, look, motivation, <laughs> it's completely up to you. Like, that's the thing is, I think a lot of people end up in academia, especially like we're clever people. Well, I, you guys are. I, I don't think I can say it about myself. But anyway, academics are clever, but we've come up with this shitty ass system where we, where like early careers researchers are not given any power to like get on their own grants or do anything or be in control of their own career. So um, academia wasn't for me, but 
the thing is, is that I didn't make the steps. I, I saw a system that I wanted to change that was outside of my control. And I was like, I'm going to fight the system. And I lost. So I left academia because I couldn't take it. But now knowing what I know, you know, like I would have certainly controlled what I could control and, and use those to form my goals. Um, and so look, Pi, it, it's hard. Motivations for staying in academia is really dependent on what your goals are and what you want to achieve. If you want a little bit more security, if you want a paycheck, if, if you don't want to apply for grants all the time, that's a great reason to get out of academia. But uh, you know, you do have to think about what you want from your career, from your uh, sort of, uh, to, that would fulfill you essentially. Um, and so I, I decided to leave academia because instead of doing my job, I was causing scenes everywhere. Uh, I was a nightmare to work with. I actually sent a fake PhD to UniSA because they asked me for my PhD. So I printed one off online. I'm, I'm laughing, but it is terrible. I printed one off online from the World Global University and I sent it to them and they accepted it as my real PhD. And on my uh, staff card, it said a PhD from the World Global University. That was a symptom of me acting up because I was trying to control the things I couldn't control. I was miserable. Um, but yes, you... You have to work with what you want. Um, and when did I, how do you know, find out that academia is not quite for you? It was, yeah, when I was working up, uh, when I was trying to control the things that I, was, I couldn't control. And um, I think we see people that leave academia as, you know, failures, as leaving academia. But you look at the, look at the numbers, less than 1% of, of PhDs actually end up in tenured academic positions. And that was from 2016 or six or something. I reckon it's even worse now. And so we're clever people. Why don't we look at the data and start building our careers and our kind of our own paths towards stuff we actually want to do instead of getting to a roadblock and being like, you know what? I'm chucked out and I have no idea what I want to do because I didn't get my grant or I didn't get the next thing. But academia is a fun game. It's just very weird in a number of ways. And that's why people, I think, need a little bit of help navigating it. Um, and that's it. Is, I think, is that my time? Um, we've got a couple more minutes if anyone else has got any questions. Oh, great. All yeah. right, Daniel. How did you manage expectations, sunk cost fallacy and regret and other issues that come from considering a major jump at the risk of starting out. At Daniel, what a great question. Oh my God. Um, you know what? You, the sunk cost fallacy, like you feel like the further down the path you go, the more you're like, I need to be here. I've earned it. You know, I'd got my own funding at Flinders Uni. I'd, I'd been successful in um, securing some students to work on my ideas. And I was like, oh my God, I'm doing so well. I'm amazing. And then I realized that, oh my God, like it's, this isn't going to work out. So it was so hard to leave. And uh, regret comes from not making decisions quick enough towards your goals. And so I knew, I think once I kind of left my Flinders position into, and I went to UniSA, that's where I caused the kerfuffle with the fake PhD. Um, the, like the regret comes from not following through and not and, and being really sort of um, focused on oh, just the, the wrong things. And so it is a big step. It isn't something you should take lightly. But what I recommend is if you are considering leaving academia is going out and building up a portfolio of evidence of things you like to do. And for me, it was science communication. So I started a blog, andymatter.net, that no longer exists, but it got me an internship at Cosmos magazine. And so those were the things I could control. And I stepped tiny, tiny bit inside and out, inside and out, um, until I ended up finding what I wanted. And I think if I had spent a lot of time setting goals before that, it wouldn't have taken me three years to be like, oh, I like doing this, uh, you know. So I hope that helps. And outside of your comfort zone, if you're not outside of your comfort zone, at least once a day, you're not growing. And if you're not growing, you're shrinking. And you're, so make sure that you do something that scares you every single day a little bit. Like I'm not talking about like skydiving or something weird like that. But uh, if you want to do something, yes, you've got to get out of your comfort zone if you want to grow. And it's an unfortunate thing. People love staying in our little bubbles, but uh, sometimes the most important things are just on the other side of that really scary thing. And it is awesome. I, I've, I have to say, though, I have been privileged in the fact that my partner has supported me throughout my entire decision making. And uh, without her, 
I would not have been able to do it as comfortably and explore and take so long just being like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so yes, it, it does, it, it does depend on your situation as well. Um, and yes. It, We've it, got uh, one question in the Q and A sure. to quick answer and then we'll move on. All right. Acknowledging that you can't control what is outside of your immediate control. Does that mean we should stop advocating for those changes in academic, in the academic world? Uh, that so many of us would like to see. Incorrect. <laughs> um, no, don't stop advocating. But remember that adv the only thing you can do is the advocation. You cannot get um, tied to the decision of the decision makers that, you know, start advocating. Just keep on talking to those people. Talk on, keep on saying the things you want to change. That is so very important. But um, the moment that you get attached to an outcome is the moment when you can inherently see it as a bad thing. That's terrible. It's demotivating, but carry on advocating. But remember that the advocation is the only thing in your control, not the outcome. Um, and if you've got that mindset, I think you'll be more persuasive anyway over the longer term. So yes, I hope that works. Continue advocating to make things better for ECRs. That's your mission. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. That was awesome. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone.